All right, so the scripture this morning, I don't know how y'all felt about it, but are y'all doing okay? Because it was, it's kind of strong, right? Um, and so we acknowledge that, um, but I, I believe if we're willing to go into it, the word of God has a gift for us. I think there's an invitation in here for really a step into the fullness of the, of the life of all of us as disciples in Jesus Christ. So let's go into this difficult territory, but this beautiful territory because it's what God is inviting us into. So I think part of what we're hearing today in our scripture is what matters most to God. So that's something that's worth our time to, to spend a little time thinking about, right? And I think what we hear in this Amos text is that it's not a well-executed church service. Phew, I just screwed up this transition, right? Um, or uh, a celebration in which we all wear nice clothes. That can be nice, but again, not what matters most to God. Or the check that we put in the offering plate. We must not allow ourselves to be deceived by the powers and the principalities of evil. What God cares most about is justice and righteousness. Is that what the script, did you all hear that in the scripture? We heard all these things that God was saying, he's setting those aside and saying even if he hates and despises them, right? And instead we heard it's justice and righteousness that, are, that demand our attention and, the, and is what God cares most about. Now I have to tell you all that the word justice is one that forces me to tread carefully. And let me explain why. It's one that I think a lot of us have heard used in partisan in a partisan manner, and maybe by a lot of different sources where they say, oh, justice means this, or justice means this, and supporting this kind of policy that maybe is partisan. That's not what I'm trying to talk about today, even though those, those things can be connected. But for me, I'm trying to understand what is the biblical understanding of justice? What is God talking about through Amos for us here today? It's much like the word evangelical. I don't know how you all feel about this, but I consider myself an evangelical. I know it gets used in our society in a different way, and I can't control that. But what I can control is that the Bible says that we're meant to be people who share the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what evangelical means. I'm not going to give up on that word, no matter how other people use it. I'm going to clarify to people, but that's, I'm going to keep using the word. Likewise, I think we need to say we're going to continue to be a people who fight and care for justice. It's a biblical word. It's a very important um, idea and value in Scripture. And so we're going to care about justice. So can we talk about justice a little bit today? Is that we're, we're, on, we're able to do that? We're not doing it in any kind of partisan way. We're doing it as Christians. So the question then is, what does Amos mean by justice? Well, let's, let's get a little background. Amos is writing in the northern kingdom, and what's happening is they had, a, they had laws and a legal system that were not being honored. It wasn't that they didn't have laws. In fact, they had laws. They were just laws. It's that they were being ignored and not being applied correctly and equally. Now, that was happening at the same time. There was an economic shift there where there were a few who were getting very wealthy, and then the vast majority were getting poorer and poorer. And so all that's taking place with the Israelites, and they were thinking, hey, God's happy with us. We're the chosen people. We're having these assemblies. We're having these religious services and these rituals. We can kind of pat ourselves and feel, feel good about how we're living and the way we're doing life together while ignoring this lack of justice that Amos and God wanted them to see. This is so central to who you're, who you're meant to be, and it's so central to your faith. It was because of that reality that Amos prophesied that God was very angry and that the consequences would be harsh. And if you want to follow down that track a little further, Amos' prophecy gets proved very, very true, and they end up losing the northern kingdom not that long after this. And people look back and went, oh, looks like Amos was right. So I want to make, see how we feel in terms of our own connection with Amos' context. I don't think that I'm going out on a limb to say that we, likewise, should have some concerns about a potential lack of justice and righteousness in our society. Do you all agree with me that laws are often applied differently or not at all, depending on factors that should not matter, right? It's not that we don't have laws. It's not that we don't have some beautiful principles all the way back from our founders, right? It's whether they're being applied correctly. Let me give another example. Do you all think it's true that an expensive lawyer is able to make a massive difference in somebody's legal situation, whereas somebody who could not afford that would have a different result. Is that the case? I mean, I think that's more or less a fact in our, in our nation, and it's, a, it's not an easy one to overcome, but I think it's something we should name and say, well, this is not how it's meant to be, and we care about this, and God cares about this. How about this? And again, you, please hear me clearly, because I believe no matter who we vote for or any of our partisan leanings, 
This is a very true statement for all the way across the board. Do we live in a time in which all of us should be concerned that our legal system could be weaponized against political opponents? You all have seen this, right? And it doesn't matter. I don't care which side you tend towards or whatever. It's happening all across the board where there's at least a concern or threats that if this one wins, then we're going to go against this, go against the, go after these people. And if this one wins, we're going to go after these people. That's not how it's meant to be, is it, friends? No, right? That's not how our nation was set up. And this is not justice, right? I think this is a lot like the things that Amos was talking about and was seeing in his context. On our Thursday morning Bible study, we were talking about this, and someone asked rhetorically, wow, was Amos writing in 2023? <laughs> um, and I think we're together, right, that the church should be concerned about the status of justice in our society. So then we are to ask, okay, so what's our role? What are we meant to do? For one, we just can't, we have to learn from the Israelites, right? We cannot let ourselves become complacent. When we learn of an injustice, our response can't be, yeah, yeah, but that's disappointing, but it's not affecting me, or eh, that's one small thing, so I'm not going to choose to care about it. The church must be a people who stand up for justice as one of our greatest values. So I'm going to share these as what I hope is more of a conversation starter, a conversation starter between you and God, a conversation starter within the church and your friendships and your brothers and sisters in Christ at your homes, and potentially with me as your pastor. But these are not meant to be exhaustive, and certainly I'm not the expert. But here's a few things that your pastor thought we can do as we try to be a people of justice. Firstly, we must work for the opportunities for justice which are closest to us. So I think of this much like the Christian imperative to love our neighbors as ourselves, right? We are invited to work for justice in our workplaces, our neighborhoods, our community. I mean, just the, anything that God puts before us is an invitation, right? That's how it is with neighbors. Our neighbors are whoever God puts in our midst on a given moment or a given day. In the same way, I think when we see injustice, whenever we come across it, it's worth our attention. I mean, I was just thinking of examples of this. And I, I don't know. I mean, say you live in a neighborhood, it's got an HOA, and what you're finding out is happening is that the... HOA board members, they're being treated differently than the rest of the neighborhood. So you, you live next door and you're on the HOA board, so you don't, you've never gotten any fines, but the person next to you, their, their lawn is the same length as you, but they get fined for it. That's not, that's injustice, right? That's not how it's supposed to work. And so we stand up and say, hey, people are being treated differently here. Again, it's a small example, but if it comes before us, I believe it's something we should care about and we should get involved in. The question for us is, how can we stand up for this person and bring some attention to an injustice. Now, I'm aware as we kind of go down this path and think of other examples that it could easily sound pretty cumbersome or unpleasant. You might think, well, this is not my favorite invitation, Pastor John, to live like that and get involved in those kind of things. And I want to acknowledge that without a doubt, standing up for justice will not be easy. In fact, I believe it's going to make us uncomfortable at times or the people around us uncomfortable. But is easy what God has promised us? No, do y'all y'all hear that in scripture? It's going to be easy. It's about doing the easiest thing. No, right? That's not a biblical word. Justice is a biblical word. Easy is not. <laughs> and I, I share that kind of in a in a funny way, but I'm serious that I think we've learned that in life, right? The things that are easiest are usually not really the things that are worth our time and attention. It's when it's when God is inviting us and calling us to something that takes faith and something that's challenging, where we really see a difference made and where our lives are truly changed and where the best things happen, right, in those kind of relationships and that kind of work. So I was thinking about this idea of being comfortable, and I was thinking about we wouldn't truly be comfortable knowing that there's injustice happening around us and choosing to do nothing about it. Ultimately, I think what happens, yeah, maybe a short a temporary com comfort, but the greater discomfort would be knowing deep down that God wants us to do something and that we have turned away, right? And this is what can happen if we just over and over again think, ah, I don't want to get involved. I'm just going look to look, to the, look the other way. And I think that we end up having a greater discomfort. We're like, gosh, there's more that we're meant to be doing or saying. So I believe that the choice to get involved and to fight for justice is going to ultimately be like pretty much every other time that we say yes to the word of God. It will be challenging and it will be worth it. What we will end up seeing is God carrying us as we are joined together in ministry for the things that matter most to God. It is a beautiful thing. We are doing something and we know this is, this is worth my time. This is worth it. Secondly, we must be a people that continue to value truth. I know that probably sounds like an easy one. I can't imagine there's anybody that would say, oh, I don't really care about truth. I, I realize that, that sounds easy, 
but it's not that easy sometimes. We live in a world in which we know that our news outlets are partisan and divisive. Is that true? Now, I, I want to say that because it doesn't matter. All, it's all the way across the board, right? This is not some sort of partisan attempt on my part at all. It's just a fact, I believe, of the society we live in. And if that's not your experience, I'd love to hear more about what your experience is or what you're watching or reading. Um, and please let me know. But the reason why I can say something like that is because even if there were an unbiased source out there that really that was their, all that they cared about was truth, the thing is, they wouldn't have the farthest reach, and they wouldn't have the staff and the money to be the give, you know, to be the first ones on the spot and give us the groundbreaking stuff. Because that's that version of the news would not be getting the most clicks and the most likes and the most shares and all that stuff, and ultimately the most money, right? So what happens is we get we get the news that we've ultimately ended up chosen cho choosing as a society, and it can be partisan and divisive. And so what we, I believe, as the church, are meant to do is to acknowledge that. We live in a complicated reality in which there can be lies and truth that come from multiple sides, right? I know that it's, it'd be much easier if it was just, it was just oh, that one station that we all just agree with and it's completely right, but I don't think that ex exists. And so our reality means that we must not allow ourselves to just accept one side's biased and partisan presentation of the facts. If we want, really want to see what standing up for the truth looks like, think about those rare times, and we do see them, right? when someone stands up against the party or the network that they tend to prefer. I mean, for me, it's so powerful to see that when someone acknowledges failings of their own or of someone that they voted for, now I'm like, okay, you're worth my attention right now. I might learn something from you because you're willing to say, hey, we got this partly wrong or I don't agree with this whole, this whole um, casting of things or this whole sharing of this story. What happens then is you could say, okay, maybe this is somebody who's actually valuing truth over a partisan agenda. And that's what the church must always be for. It must be a people of truth. All truth comes from God and it points to God. And so that's what we are invited to live into. And we don't have to just take these divisive uh, sides every single time, hook, line, and sinker. Now, the third one was that we must stay in relationship with people of diverse circumstances. And this is going to take intentionality, right? There's a lot that kind of about the way our society is set up that can kind of get us in a little grouping where people are in the same spot as we are in life. So it takes intentionality, and I acknowledge that. It's not always easy. But we want to have relationships with people that are in a different station in life from us. Maybe it's asking a server at a restaurant how their life is going. What's going on in there? What are they, what's, what are they even thinking about and worrying about these days? That might be helpful. What about the gift of being in the church? We live in a multi-generational church, and that's such a gift where we could take the brave step of intentionally talking to somebody who's in a different age bracket than we are and ask them about what their current needs are or what, what are they thinking about or what are they focused on these days. And we might kind of broaden our perspective. We might hear some things that are a little, di a little different than the things that we were dealing with. And it's not that our things don't matter or theirs matter more. It's that we have c come across more opportunities to see the justice and the injustice happening among us. And maybe there's something that we can be involved with. And it means always finding opportunities to serve the poor in our community. Through ministries like RayCap or the Good Neighbor Connection here, those are some examples. We want to build relationships with the people that we may be offering to assist, right? That is so important and such a gift when we do that. The church must be a people that are able to engage one another across all kinds of difference. I really believe that to live into the full good news of the gospel means that we are always seeking to learn more of the ways that God is at work among us. We serve a really, really big God. And the God of grace is doing things, yes, in our personal lives and in our circles, but all beyond them too. And so we want to learn about those things and hear what God is doing and see maybe if there's something that we're invited to be a part of. I was thinking about an example where you could be talking to a brother or sister, a brother or sister in Christ, and they might be going off in a direction, and you might be thinking, gosh, 90% of what this person is saying, I really don't agree with, um, and it's maybe not that helpful for me. But even that 10%, right, there might be this 10% of what they're sharing that enlightens our perspective that gives us a little bit more understanding of what God is doing or of, or of the reality, our common reality that we all face. There might be some part there that we could learn from that's different from something that we and our friends often talk about or see things. We must not become a church or a denomination that ever shirks from caring about justice and righteousness in our communities. I, I got to tell you, I really believe that Satan is enormously satisfied 
with this narrative that is out there that Christianity is solely about a relationship with Jesus and personal piety, and that this mission and its care and concern for justice and social holiness, that that's not important, or that's not even a part of it. You all, you all, have you all heard some of that? I and mean, that's how some people are saying, we should just, just set aside all of that stuff. It's too difficult, it's too hard, it gets challenging to have these kind of conversations, and so we're just gonna kinda come to church for an hour a week, and we'll say the same creed, and it doesn't really matter about how we live the rest of the week. It doesn't matter. We're not going to stand up for these much more, these, these big things that I think Scripture is very clear matter so much to God, justice and righteousness. No, they all come together. And I think we know this to be true in the Methodist Church that you can't really do one without the other. If you are seeking to have a great, strong relationship with Jesus Christ, you're seeking to grow in your likeness of him, it's going to mean that you get called out to care for the poor and to fight for justice and to get involved in things that are larger than things that happen just in our prayer closets, right? It comes together. They, they, they call us out. So Church United Methodist Church and the people called Methodists will continue to be a community that is devoted to justice and righteousness. And I know you all have been long, long, long before I've come here. We will continue to have Harvest Sundays and partner with great ministries like RACAP. We will send resources to our brothers and sisters in Malawi our UMCOR ministries internationally and, do and domestically, our brothers and sisters at Nuevo Almanacer, and to people within our local community as they have personal needs. And we're going to continue to measure the things that God has said matter. I was so proud and that was so cool the first time I came into the narthex out there. You all may have noticed it, that this we've got this impact board that just seeks to measure some of the things that God is doing among us. And they showed me that this is a church that understands that discipleship takes us beyond how we spend our Sunday mornings. With joy, we celebrate that the abundant life in Christ is so much bigger than that. We believe that God's kingdom has been revealed in Jesus Christ, and we are invited to live into the justice and the righteousness that he is bringing wherever he sends us. We believe as God has called to make us disciples of Jesus Christ, you all know the Methodist mission, for the transformation of the world. I don't know if you all know that. That's what we're called to do. So that means we're going to continue to engage. We have seen, and so we know, that God's unconditional love is that which has changed our lives and is transforming the world. That's how the world can change, right? It's through God's love. It's through the good news of Jesus Christ. So by the grace of God, and we need the grace of God to take us here, friends, we're going to push away and push aside our fears and our temporary comfort. Instead, we're going to become the body of Christ, as the God of resurrection continues to unite us in ministry to all the world, we're going to continue to say yes to the way of Jesus until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.